that his constituents are currently finding? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to join colleagues in paying tribute to the Honourable Member for South and on Sea. He was a good friend and an esteemed parliamentarian. I also wish to pay tribute to the Right Honourable Member for Old Baxley and Sidco. He served this House and country assiduously and will be missed by members across the House. Mr. Speaker, heating bills, food shocks, and fuel costs are all rising at a staggering speed. This winter, millions of families on universal credit will be forced to choose between eating or heating. Given the crisis in living costs we are now facing, will the Prime Minister reconsider his scrapping of the universal credit uplift and reinstate the £20 a week lifeline he has just taken away? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, what we're doing is ensuring that uh, we keep costs of heating down with the, the, the price cap. We put the, we put the, uh, we put, we've increased the winter uh, the, the, warm heat, the warm homes allowance uh, by £150,000 uh, £150 for 780,000 uh, homes, and we've just given local councils another half billion uh, to help uh, poorer families uh, over, uh, over the winter. But the most important thing that's happening, Mr. Speaker, in this country is that wages are going up, and uh, there, is a, there is a huge jobs boom now in this country, thanks to the policies that this government has pursued. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure my right honourable friend would agree with me that homeless people should be assisted and not arrested. The review of the repeal of the Vagrancy Act 1824 has now been concluded. Does my right honourable friend agree with me, therefore, that it is now time that the amendments to the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, which are being considered in the other place, should be adopted? so that we can consign the Vacancy Act to the history books forever, but give the police the powers they need to combat trespass, aggressive begging and other antisocial behaviour. Uh, Mr Speaker, my, my honourable friend is a passionate campaigner on this issue and he, 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 he's done a lot of, uh, of good things in this area. No one should be criminalised simply for having nowhere to live and I think the time has come to reconsider the Vagrancy Act, Mr Speaker, but also to redouble our efforts uh, to fight homelessness as I think we've done successfully over the pandemic but must continue to do. Dalim Fletcher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. University Hospitals, Coventry and Warwickshire NHS Trust, has dealt with more than 600 attacks on staff during the pandemic. To deter further attacks, staff in the hospital's A&E department are now wearing body cameras. It simply isn't right that doctors and nurses should have to go to such lengths just to feel safe at work. Will the Prime Minister join me in condemning those abhorrent attacks and say what immediate steps he will take to better protect our NHS heroes as they go about their work treating patients and saving lives? Yeah. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I join the Honourable Lady Opposite absolutely in condemning attacks on, uh, on all public uh, servants and particularly on NHS staff who are, who are trying to, to save people and, 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 and help people in, in their lives. And uh, what, we are, what we are doing, what we have already done, is to toughen the sentences uh, for those who assault or, for, or, who, or who harass public servants. We now come to Charlize Barlett, final question. Given the recent tragic circumstances, there has inevitably been a focus on the security of members and their staff. Mr Speaker, one aspect that is often overlooked is the fact that it is our staff who are on the front line in receiving the abusive emails and correspondence, and they take the hostile phone calls. They are private citizens, simply trying to earn a living to put food on the table and pay for their rent or their mortgage. Yet they are caught up in this vicious cycle of venom and abuse that is directed towards us. Would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, take this opportunity to acknowledge the fantastic work that our staff do and give them the credit that they so rightly deserve? Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I think that uh, my right honourable friend spoke there for the entire House of Commons because uh, we all know that uh, it is our staff, our our caseworkers, our office managers uh, who are so often uh, in the front line, who have to deal uh, with anger, uh, with intemperate uh, behaviour and with abuse, and they cope with it uh, magnificently. We all know that the the risks that they run in their daily lives, and indeed, Mr Speaker, we have seen how some House of Commons staff have paid uh, for for their sacrifice, even with their lives. And, Mr Speaker, I thoroughly echo and support and concur with what what uh, my honourable friend has said. Order. I said on Monday that the House would have an opportunity to pay tribute and remember our friend and colleague James Brokenshire. I would like to do so by inviting members to join me in a minute's silence in memory of James. Can we all please stop? Thank you. James was a politician who commanded affection and respect from colleagues, no matter which party they represented, in a parliamentary career spanning 16 years. James's contribution to public life was immense. He served in successive governments, in ministerial roles across the Home Office, as well as serving as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, and later as Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government. His commitment to serving his constituents in Old Bexley and Sidcup was also obvious to anybody who knew him. I will always remember James for his positivity, his good sense of humour and for being one of the most friendly, thoughtful, well-liked in the House of Commons. His passing is profound loss to us all. Our thoughts go out to his wife, Cathy, and the three children who are here today to watch our tributes. So I just want to remind people the family are with us, and it is great that they've turned up today, and thank you. Yeah. Order. We now come to the point where we start with the Prime Minister to start the tributes. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I'm sure the whole House will join me in, uh, and, and you in expressing our deep sorrow over the tragically early death of James Brokenshire, and in sending our heartfelt condolences to his wife, Cathy, uh, and their three children, Sophie, Gemma and Ben, uh, who are with us today, for the loss of a beloved husband and father. The many tributes paid to James a testament to the affection, respect and esteem in which he is remembered, and his skill as an able and effective politician, who served his country under three Prime Ministers in some of the most sensitive and demanding positions in government. I worked closely with James for the first time when I was Mayor of London, and he was the Honourable Member for Hornchurch, and then for Old Bexley and Sidcup. And I saw how much he cared for the interests of his constituents, always taking the time to stop and talk to people and listen to what they had to say, unflappable, earnest, sincere, and he brought those same down-to-earth qualities into other areas of his life, being photographed baking cakes in his kitchen, (laughs) starting a Twitter frenzy on the vital question of whether he owned two ovens or four, (laughs) and once when challenged by an interviewer 
to choose between South End or the South of France, his reply was swift, South End, I'm an Essex boy and proud of my roots. And he would be delighted to know that his birthplace has now achieved city status uh, in tribute to his friend, Sir David Amos, whose campaign he supported. But it was James's diligence, composure and experience as a lawyer, steeped in the art of negotiating last-minute deals that proved so valuable to the government. He held five ministerial jobs, including two in Cabinet as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and for housing communities and local government. And every one of them was fraught with traps for the unwary and opportunities for error. The fact that he improved his reputation in each post shows that we've lost an astute politician of rare ability. James served with particular distinction in the Home Office as Security and Immigration Minister, where he was fondly known by civil servants as JB. Oh good, they would say, we've got JB on this one. And he often reflected that working at the Home Office was to be on the receiving end of incessant incoming fire from the media. And it usually fell to him to brave the barrage when things got really sticky. So it's no wonder that uh, on his last day, officials presented James with an authentic military-grade tin hat. <laughs> During that tumultuous period, which I remember well, uh, he, helped, he helped to keep our country safe. He oversaw the superb security operation that protected the London Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2012. He was central to getting rid of Abu Qatada, setting him packing after more than a decade of legal wrangles, and he steered the groundbreaking modern slavery bill through Parliament, giving the police and law enforcement agencies the power they need to combat some of the most dangerous and repellent criminals of all. And through all this, he would help individuals in need, including taking the time to meet people with direct experience of government decisions. And it was after a conversation with a homeless man in Bristol that he acted to strengthen the rights of tenants and give them a greater sense of security in their homes. We can only imagine how much more good he would have done if he had been given the chance. James was in the prime of his life, with a huge amount still to offer his country. And it was the cruelest of fates that he, a non-smoker, should have been struck down by lung cancer. His tenacious fight showed the depths of his, his courage and his character. After his first bout with the disease, as colleagues will remember, he was back in this house within weeks serving in government and helping his constituents. He campaigned for better lung cancer screening, becoming the first honourable member to secure a debate on this issue in the House. He sought to dispel the stigma and misperceptions around the disease. And when James fell sick again earlier this year, even in the midst of his ordeal, he summoned the strength to record a video message encouraging others to seek help and early treatment. Every member of this House willed him then to pull through, but sadly it was not to be. James was a gentleman politician, and I hope my right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead, will allow me to quote her words that politics and Parliament would be the better if there were more people of his calibre involved and politics and Parliament are the weaker for his loss. I could not agree more. James's absence will be sorely felt in this House, in the great departments where he served, and by all the people whose lives he touched. Yeah. We've come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of the first things I learned when I arrived in this House was that there are not many glamorous roles in opposition. No one gives you a guidebook on how to do these jobs. You're appointed and off you go. 
Of course, you can ask older, wiser heads. You can appoint excellent staff. But generally, you're on your own. There's one little-known exception to this rule, a secret in Westminster, and that is when you shadow a government minister of such decency, courtesy and sense of fair play that they reach out across the divide and provide helpful pointers, you're not on your own. And so it was for me. When, as a new MP in 2015, I was appointed as Shadow Immigration Minister, I shadowed James Brokenshire. I have to admit, I was unprepared for the vagaries of the Bill Committee rules. Even years in the criminal justice system had not prepared me for the complexities of the archive uh, processes. But in one of my first outings in the Bill Committee, I almost missed my cue to make my argument. Now, some of you would see that as a blessing. <laughs> But James was far too decent for that. He wouldn't take advantage. He went out of his way to ensure not only that I was heard, but that I was heard with respect. And that was the characteristic, that was the character that was James. And from that day in 2015, we forged a friendship which lasted until his untimely death. And on these benches, my story is not an unusual story because anyone who got to know James, who worked with him or against him, ended up respecting him and liking him and willing him to pull through. At the time I got to know James, he was widely seen as an upcoming star of this House. As the Prime Minister has said, he had already played a key role in the creation of the Modern Slavery Act and had begun to carve out a reputation as an unassuming but very effective minister. He was a party leader's dream, happy to roll up his sleeves, do the tough jobs with little regard for self-promotion. But advancing your career in any walk of life isn't just about hard work and talent, although James had those in abundance. It's about who you are. And it was little surprise when James got a full role in the Cabinet, first as Northern Ireland Secretary and then as Community Secretary. And he brought his calm and understated manner, his effectiveness and his respect for others to both roles. And he will be long remembered for it. When someone is taken as young as James was by a cruel disease like cancer, there is an inevitable sense that they were robbed of fulfilling their potential. And James was. He had achieved so much. But I strongly believe, we all strongly believe, that he had so much more to give. Characteristically, right to the end, he was campaigning to remove the stigma from lung cancer in order to improve the lives of others, a cause I hope this House continues to champion in his memory. James's wife and young family are with us here today. We send our condolences, and if I may say so, they should be very proud of their husband and father. Amen. And they should know that across these, this house, on all of these benches, he commanded enormous respect and goodwill. Amongst his constituents, he was very well liked. He was a friend to many of us across this House, including me. Our politics is poorer without him. We will miss him, but we will all ensure that his memory lives on. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Father of the House, Pete, Sir Peter Bottom. <laughs> on the 30th of April 2018, Mr Speaker said it must be enormous fun, Shea Brokenshire, at mealtime. That was when James said he used to discuss local government with his father, when his father was the chief executive in the borough I then served. James, in that column 10, used seven words to describe his father as having a focus and a dedication as a public servant. James learnt that lesson. He also said that private leaseholders should not be have the costs of fire remediation passed onto them, 
I think fulfilling his dedication as Housing Minister, I invite the Chancellor and the Prime Minister to discuss how that can be fulfilled, because at the moment those costs are being passed on to those leaseholders. We now come to the Leader of the SNP in Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> I think we all share the real sense of sadness that in the space of two days we are meeting again to pay tribute to another <coughs> deceased colleague. Two colleagues taken in very different circumstances, but both taken well before their time. Mr Speaker, James Brokenshire was a young man who clearly had so much more to give. That is what must be so tragic for his colleagues and friends on the government benches, and we are all very conscious and compassionate to the pain that they must be feeling this week. But most especially, we think of James's young family. On behalf of these benches, our thoughts and prayers are, are with his wife Catherine, his son Ben, and his daughters Sophie and Gemma. It is important to mark the manner in which that family have dealt with their grief, but I know that they have been deeply involved in remarkable fundraising efforts since James's untimely death. That spirit that the family have shown since his death is no doubt a tribute to the way in which James himself dealt with his illness. But I think all of us across this House looked on with deep admiration and awe at the sheer bravery he showed while bravely battling against the cancer that sadly ultimately took his life. My own experience and engagement with James was mainly when he was the Minister at the Home Office. When he was an Immigration Minister, I remember dealing with James in some detail on a particular case concerning a family in the Highlands who were being threatened with deportation. And I'm glad to say, Mr Speaker, that after some considerable effort from all involved, that the family eventually got the resolution that they desperately needed. I know from colleagues in Northern Ireland as well that although his time there came at a politically delicate and difficult period, he remained on very good terms with all the parties during his period as Secretary of State. I think it's fair to say that that in itself is no mean feat yeah, yeah. for any British Secretary of State that serves there. And I can only think that it was because of the way that he approached people and the way that he approached his work. Because it has been very rightly said that there wasn't a man interested in the insubstantial distractions of politics. He quietly got on with his job. He was, above all else, diligent and determined. The mark of a man and our memory of him will be of a dedicated minister, a loyal friend and a dedicated father. James battled to the very end against his cancer. Now that his battle is over, may he rest in peace. God bless you, James. Amen. Theresa May. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I had the enormous privilege of working with James Brokenshaw in government, first of all for six years in the Home Office, and then in his roles as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and Communities Secretary. James was a remarkable man. He was an outstanding minister, a great constituency member of parliament, and a true friend. Words have been used by others, such as diligent, hardworking, and he was both of those. As a minister, he was assiduous in dealing with the briefs that he, was, uh, that he read. He was thoughtful in his consideration of the issues and careful in his decision-making. That is what you want from a government minister. He gave his time and effort because he understood the importance of the decisions he was making. He cared about people and he cared about the work he was doing. And that came through in all the decisions he made and in the way in which he reached out across this house to ensure that those decisions were the right ones. So he was an outstanding minister, but he was also a very good constituency MP. Very often, uh, if you try to contact a minister on a Friday, they're in their office. But actually, James, more often than not, was in his constituency. And that's what he understood 
all of us are here because our constituents have mm. placed us here. Mm. And anybody who is fortunate enough to become a government minister is only there because their constituents have placed them yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we should never forget that yeah, is the basis yeah, yeah, yeah. of our being yeah, yeah. here and our responsibilities. He was a true friend. If, from what I've said and what others have said, you get the impression that James was just a hard-working workaholic, James was great fun. Mm -hmm. uh, evenings with Cathy and James were evenings of fun and laughter. And he was also a loving family man. And I remember when uh, he had been diagnosed, first diagnosed with his lung cancer, and he was stepping down from government. His first thought to me was about the impact it would have on Cathy and the family. He was that loving family man. He was out there in his constituency, and he great gave dedicated public service to this country. Mm -hmm. The government is the poorer for his loss. Yeah, yeah. This parliament is the poorer for his loss. And our country is the poorer for his loss. Yeah. Yeah. John Cryer. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr Speaker. I've, I suppose James and I must have met in 2003 when he was selected as the Conservative candidate for Hornchurch. I was the, I was the sitting MP and, uh, in 2005. Um, James won and, and I lost. Um, and it's sometimes quite easy to be bitter and angry when you, when you lose. But I couldn't be bitter and angry with James because he was such a nice bloke, he was so helpful. Um, and I can remember in the run-up to that campaign, during it and then afterwards, I cannot remember ever even having harsh words with James, never mind falling out with him. And that's what I will always carry about James. Since then, we always kept in touch and obviously we both ended up in Parliament together. So we ended up working together. And we always had a very pleasant relationship. We always got on very well. I only saw him quite recently, as most of us did, um, a few months ago when he thought he'd beaten the illness. Sadly, he hadn't beaten the illness. And I'll just finish by saying this. Um, as the former Prime Minister just said, this place is much the poorer for James's loss. So is the country. And so is, although this may be none of my business, so I suspect is the Conservative Party. Yeah. Yeah. Karen Bradley. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I want to make two points. First of all, about James and the work he did, but also James as a friend. I followed James into two ministerial positions. I took over from him as the Minister for Modern Slavery when he became the Minister for Security and Immigration. And then I followed him into Northern Ireland. Um, they were very big shoes to fill. Um, goodness me, the way that officials talked about him, JB would do it, JB will sort it, JB had got this organised. Um, it was quite overwhelming at times to follow in those footsteps and to see the work that he'd done. And my right honourable friend from Maidenhead has summed up exactly. He was diligent, he was careful in his decision making, and he was thoughtful. But he always remembered there were people involved in the decisions he was taking. It was never taken in the abstract. He always thought about the people who'd be directly affected. I followed, I, I had to um, cover for him when he was immigration minister for a couple of weeks. He had a medical procedure and I covered his role. Typical James, he, took, he made sure it was during recess so that he didn't take any time away from this place. But I was astonished when I sort of arrived, my, the red box arrived for me, and then the next two red boxes arrived, which was James's work. And every single day, James was getting through at least double the workload that anybody else in the department was covering. And he read every single one of those letters, particularly the letters about immigration. He dealt with them all personally, and he really really thought carefully about what he was doing to try and make sure the people who were affected were helped. In Northern Ireland, James Brokenshire should be the person who's remembered for being the architect of the agreement that got Stormont back in, December, in January 2020. If it hadn't been for James's diligent work then, there would be no sitting Stormont now. And, and there's so much that he achieved there. And I know from the messages I've received from people across Northern Ireland how warmly he was regarded there. But James was my friend, 
He had a great sense of humour. We keep hearing he was nice. He was so much more than nice. Goodness me, he was wicked at times with that sense of humour. He was so easy to talk to, but he had judgement and, and he could give advice and he could give wise counsel. I remember at the 50th birthday party we were both at, Madam Deputy Speaker. It was a wonderful occasion and, and his family put a marvellous tribute on and we all learnt so much about James and his life. I will miss him so very much and I'm so grateful I was allowed to speak in this debate. I'm in all upon the side. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. James was my constituency neighbour. I remember on election night, having just been elected, James came over to congratulate me and introduce himself. I remember thinking, whilst he was introducing himself, that I know exactly who you are. Just goes to show the humble kind of person he was, never taking it for granted. We discussed having a catch-up in Parliament when I settled into my role. Due to the pandemic and him falling again, we didn't get round to it, and I'm very sad about that. Just recently, I went to Bexley Civic Parade. It was my first in my role as an MP, and I'll say the first big event we had since lockdown restrictions ease. I was walking alongside my honourable friend for Bexley from Crayford, and I'm sure he will agree with me that James's absence was clearly missed. Whilst it was nice to be there on one-to-one -one with the Honourable Member, it was also sad James wasn't able to take part, and I think that really, um, the seriousness of his illness began to sink in with me. Since James's death, I've spoken to many community groups, individuals and labour activists from his constituency, and they have nothing but nice words to say. Anisha Davis says James would often be seen on a packed community train. She remembers asking him to support her in the second referendum. He was never dismissive and always open to a bit of light ribbon from Labour activists on issues they disagreed on. And I know my Labour activists. And I know what she said, to, said is true, that he is a true gent. Claire said her dad said he supported many events with the Irish community. Theresa Gray said he supported the food banks when he first started in Bexley. Dave Tingle, who stood against James, told me that he went out of his way to help him when he had a fire in his house. The Mayor of Bexley, Dave Easton, on behalf of staff at Bexley Council, said James was a wonderful individual, totally dedicated to his residents, a man of utter integrity who cared so much about Bexley. And Daniel um, Francis and Grant Blower told, both told me that James reached out to them when their wives had cancer. This was typical of James' character, in always inquiring about and offering support to others, even though he had his own battle with cancer. No matter where you were on the political spectrum, James represented everyone in Old Betsy and Sidcup. To James's family, I hope you take comfort in knowing what high regard he was held in Betsy and beyond. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Robert Buckland. Speaker, it is with mixed feelings that I address the House today. Feelings of pride in having known my dear friend James Brokenshire, and feelings of deep sadness that he is not here in his rightful place to carry on the outstanding work that he did for his constituency, for my party, and for our country. James and I share a birth year, 1968. I like to think it was a very fine vintage indeed. <laughs> and as my honourable, my right honourable friend, the member for Staffordshire Morelands, has yeah, rightly said, six, yeah. it was at his 50th birthday party that we were able to share really happy memories and positive thoughts about a life that had been well and fully lived. And at that point, uh, unbeknownst to us, a life certainly to friends, family uh, knew about the diagnosis, a life that was about to take quite a dramatic turn for James. Uh, and the last three years have been challenging and tough for Cathy and the family, uh, but also positive in what James achieved uh, for <coughs> research and promotion of the disease of lung cancer. And as we speak today, the Roy Castle Lung Foundation already will be uh, richer to the tune of over £50,000 because of the tribute page that has been set up in James's memory by Cathy and the family. Now, looking at the tributes on that page is something I would advise all members to do. And there's one that I want to read from an anonymous donor. <coughs> and this person clearly was an official who knew James well. And he said this, 
I've not worked with anyone finer. A man of true integrity, always entirely across his brief, fiercely intelligent and incredibly kind. He was respectful to his officials, as well as rigorous in his questioning of and the testing of policy and legal positions presented to him. He was fantastic at distilling <coughs> complex information into articulate and clear responses in Parliament. I had nothing but respect and admiration for how he did his job and his dedication to public service. Amen to that. Um, the Honourable, Right Honourable Gentleman Member for Hoban and St Pancras mentioned bill committees. Well, at one point, I think we thought that James was about to gather the record for the number of bill committees that he conducted as a minister. And indeed, in the particular committee that uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman remembers, I was the other minister uh, sparring with him. We were lawyers together. But it was done with a, not just a respect for process, but a thought as to the outcome. And James was rigorously focused upon the outcome. What solution could we bring to the problem? What benefit could we bring to the wider country? And as my honourable friend for Staffordshire Moreland says, the word nice just doesn't cut it for James. Let me give you the adjectives in conclusion that I uh, would associate with my friend. Driven, quick, persuasive, funny, kind, and decent. Don't make the mistake of confusing those qualities with mere niceness, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was much, much more than that. Farewell, my friend. Thank you for everything. Yeah. There's so much that we can all say and want to say about James, and I would like to try to give everybody who wishes to speak the chance to do so. So, although we want to say so much, can we please try to say it as briefly as possible? Ian Paisley. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. In the midst of life, we are in death. Here, we have no continuing city. It's those prophetic words which, I suppose, tell us something of the suddenness of the passing of our colleague and our friend and a much-missed member of this House it teaches us that this is for real. There are no dress rehearsals. We have got to live this life and live it well. And your colleague and your friend and our colleague and our friend lived his life well, lived it dynamically and lived it in a manner that was upright and noticed by those around him. Decent, honourable, kind, helpful, all words that have already been used uh, today in this House and will remain as a true reminder of our colleague. It is my honour to pay tribute to James Brokenshire on behalf of my colleagues here on the Ulster bench, as it is referred to. James was a well-respected Secretary of State, an unknown quantity when he first arrived, much missed with due respect to the others that followed when he had gone. He was uh, indeed a man who had genuine qualities uh, that reflected in the way in which he took the decisions on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland. His many years of service here in Parliament are marked by not only service to the people of Great Britain, but to the people of all of the United Kingdom, which of course includes Northern Ireland. So we salute that memory. We salute it with honour and I hope with dignity. And to his beloved wife, Cathy, to his lovely children, we extend our sincere condolences and we hope that they find some rainbow of hope over the deep valley of tears that they have wept. Dr Liam Fox. It bears repeating that James was a charming, kind, funny and intelligent man, devoted to his constituency, his country and, above all, to his family. He was a joy to work with, collegiate and considerate, as the Leader of the Opposition mentioned. Those of us who had the pleasure of travelling abroad with him will also know that occasionally as we would have said in Scotland, some drink might have been taken. In an era when we have come to question the conduct of some in our political life, he was courteous and good-humoured to a fault at the dispatch box and beyond. And I hope it's not going too far to say that he was self-effacing and humble and without ego, almost to the point that one might wonder what he was doing in this place yeah. to begin with. <laughs> But James wanted something good to come from the illness that he suffered and with which he coped with such dignity and courage. There is an urgent need for lung cancer screening in this country. 
to improve long-term survival and save lives. And as the Prime Minister said, he was the first to hold a debate on the topic in the House of Commons after returning to work following his initial diagnosis and treatment. And Cathy and the rest of the family wanted to support a cause that he cared so passionately about. And as my right honourable friend has said, the Roy Castle Lung Foundation, which, of which I'm very pleased to say uh, my wife is the medical director, uh, has benefited by over £50,000 because of the work that James did. As we've seen with James, lung cancer is a disease that can affect anyone, young and old, male and female, smoker and non-smoker. And lung cancer is the UK's most common cause of cancer. It's responsible for over a fifth of all male and female cancer deaths. Approximately 48,000 people are diagnosed in the UK every year. And when James passed away on Thursday, the 7th of October, another 95 people will have died on the same day of the same disease. And it's sobering to think that one person dies of lung cancer every 15 minutes. James wanted me to give the message that less than a fifth of people with lung cancer are currently diagnosed at stage one. <coughs> Two thirds are not diagnosed until they reach stage three or stage four. Symptoms are vague and can be often be missed. We therefore need to find a way to get, rid, get ahead of the disease that claimed James' life all too early. We need a lung cancer screening programme and I urge the government to treat this with uh, prior priority in our health policy. We cannot bring James back, but we can ensure that others live because of his legacy. Yeah. Yeah. Clive Ethel. Speaker, uh, I really rise to uh, contribute to this debate, really to add to what has been said in terms of to under, uh, underline uh, what's been said about James in the way that he was liked on both sides of this house. He was my neighbour across the borough boundary of Bexley, and my constituency in Greenwich next door. And we got to know each other when he moved to uh, Old Bexley and Sidcup uh, from Hornchurch uh, uh, in the middle part of his career in this house, let me put it that way. I also faced him across the uh, committee floor uh, when he was uh, a, a Home Office Minister and I was a Shadow Home Office Minister and got to know him a little bit better then. The one thing I learned about uh, James was that uh, if you were going to face him across the dispatch box here or, or, it, or in committee, you had to be well informed because he certainly was. He did his job diligently, he was extraordinarily talented and he was uh, a convivial and, uh, uh, and decent uh, opponent. So I'd just like to say to his family um, that uh, I send them my deepest sympathies. They've lost a, a wonderful person and uh, a, an extremely talented politician and my hearts go out to them. Yeah. Stephen Metcalf. Thank you, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, for giving me the opportunity to pay tribute to my friend and our colleague James Brokenshire, who very sadly, as we've heard, lost his courageous battle against lung cancer only two weeks ago. To lose one colleague is a tragedy, but to lose two in two weeks is almost too much to bear. There is so much that I wanted to share with this House about my experiences of James, and much will be said and has been said about James the politician. But I want to talk about James, my friend. The James I met some 45 years ago uh, at Staples Road County Primary School. <laughs> we grew up in the same area of Epping Forest. We joined the local Conservative Association. We fought local elections together as either candidates helping each other or others to get elected. We supported the fantastic Member of Parliament for Epping Forest, <laughs> Madam <laughs> Deputy Speaker, <laughs> to ensure that she was elected in 1997, that you were elected on this occasion in 1997, and retained your uh, seat at every election. And you must feel this loss as keenly as many of us yeah, do yeah, here yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's unfortunate that you are not able to express that, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, we worked together. Uh, to support Robin Squire to try and regain his Hornchurch seat in 2001, the seat that eventually sent James to this place in 2005 uh, and inspired me to find a seat that I could win. James was the embodiment of all that is good. He was decent, honest and faithful. He demonstrated integrity and good humour in everything and was respected by all. And now we have to say goodbye 
Goodbye to James, taking from us all, especially from Kathy, and from Sophie, and Gemma, and from Ben. All too cruelly and all too untimely. And I do send my deepest regrets and sympathies to you. As a tribute to James, as we've heard, Kathy has set up a muchloved.com page, which when I last checked as well, was well over £50,000 had been raised in memory of James and in support of the Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation. And I'm sure that we all agree that that is a fitting tribute. Uh, and I would encourage people to visit that site. As Bob Geldof once said, give us your money, because it will make a difference. But I look for the government to do more. As we have seen throughout this pandemic, the, our UK science base is capable of extraordinary achievements at breakneck speed when required. Now, as we move past the pandemic, I would think it would be a fitting use of our science superpower status to lead the world in finding better treatments and cures for this cruel disease. There are so many occasions I could share with you, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we have shared good times together, whether it's over a glass of wine at our Wasters Wine Club uh, or just out on the campaign trail. But I fear enemy is my, uh, sorry, time is my enemy. So I will simply say, James, I will miss you greatly. Please rest in peace. And by the grace of God, rise in glory. Yeah. Goodbye, my friend. Yeah. My honourable friend is absolutely right in everything that he's just said. I'm going to break the rules for one second to say myself. <laughs> they were my boys, James. <laughs> and his friends in Epping Forest when I was the new MP 25 years ago. And they worked for the cause in which we all believed. And I watched James grow from being a young Conservative to being a member of parliament, to being a minister, and to being a cabinet minister with great pride. And now we will watch James and Cathy's children follow in his footsteps. He was and always will be so proud of them as we are all are of James as our friend. He will be so greatly missed and never ever forgotten. <coughs> Chris Bryant. Uh, thank you very much and I'm grateful for you breaking the rules. Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I just want to add one adjective to the list that was provided earlier, which is the word magnanimous, because I think you could see in every single moment of any engagement you ever had with him, even if you were completely and utterly disagreeing with every single word in his sentence or his paragraph or his speech, that there was magnanimity in, which, in the way in which he dealt with you and in the way he dealt with everybody in his house. I can imagine it was exactly the same in his constituency. Um, I'll let the House in on a secret, which is that there is something of a cancer survivors club here. And um, I always hoped that James would always be in that club. Uh, he was uh, magnificent with me when I had my cancer a few years ago. And I know that many others have had exactly the same experience. Um, cancer's a bugger. You think it's gone away and then it comes back. You have no idea that it was there and suddenly you find you've got stage three or stage four cancer, and this is particularly true, as the uh, honourable member just said, in relation to lung cancer. You know, you, you think to yourself, why didn't I spot it earlier? And so it's not just sadness and fear that you and your family are surrounded with, it's anger and guilt and all sorts of complicated feelings. And I'm sure that for many of, the, of those who've had cancer in the house, there will be a sense of guilt that some of us are still here and he's not. What does that leave us with? A simple feeling that um, we must, we must, we must devote ourselves, especially after this year of COVID, to making sure that early detection is possible for everybody. In all the different cancers, there's so many different kinds. Um, I think it would be helpful if Mr. Speaker were able to circulate the details of the website where we might all be able to contribute so that there's a bit more money going back into cancer care. We need to get a lot of the cancer trials back up and running. We need to make sure that people aren't frightened of going to the doctor. They do get seen and they, 
and, and, and all the backlog is dealt with. My final thought is that uh, I don't know whether members will have ever read Thomas Hardy's book, The Woodlanders, but at the end, Giles Winterbourne has died. And the woman who's always loved him says that she will never... She's addressing him directly, and she says, um, I'll never forget thee, for you was a good man, and you did good things. David Evanix. Mr Speaker, I'd like to pay my tribute to my friend and parliamentary neighbour, James Brokenshire. He was a hard-working, efficient and effective minister, and also a strong champion for his constituents in Old Bexley and Sidcup. During the past decade, I've been privileged to really get to know James and to work closely with him on so many issues and campaigns on behalf of our borough of Bexley. Serious in his work, but he had a great sense of humour, which we experienced on many Bexley social occasions. And we will miss him at all of those in the future. He was a devoted husband and father. And I'd like to pay a special tribute to his wife, Cathy, yeah, yeah. who gave yeah. such great support to James in so many ways over so many years. And we're grateful to you, Cathy, and the family, for all that you have done in Bexley, while James was a Member of Parliament. He was a devout Christian and a man of honour and integrity, who will be sorely missed locally and in this Parliament. Our country, Madam Deputy Speaker, has lost a great public servant, and in Bexley we have lost a real friend and an excellent Member of Parliament. We thank you, James, for all you've done. We will always remember you with pride, with love and affection, and aware of all the commitment you had to causes that we must continue to support and develop in memory of a great man. David Davis. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I first became a friend of James when he joined the Home Office, Shadow Home Office team, about a decade and a half ago. Uh, it was a time of huge controversy, and as you can imagine, it was a heavy-duty team. My brother Fred Rashford was a member, uh, Dominic Grieve, etc., four people who are future cabinet members in that team. And so I thought that this incredibly self-effacing and uh, amazingly modest man, certainly given our profession, amazingly modest man, would take a bit of time to get up to speed. Not a bit of it. In no time at all, this man had got a reputation as a safe pair of hands. Now, that may sound terribly <coughs> mundane. It's not. It's a curse. Because <laughs> well, know, is it, is it attracts every hospital pass oh, there is. <laughs> you, see, you see how it works. The morning meeting, I get in and I say, right, this is difficult. Yeah, give it to James. Yeah. Um, oh, this one's a nightmare. James can manage it. Yeah. This one's impossible, but James can. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how it works. And of course, it became a light motif of his career. Every job he, get, he was given was both impossible and thankless. <laughs> Security and immigration minister under Theresa May. What the hell? You know? <laughs> <laughs> At the same time. Northern Ireland minister dealing with Paisley and Co. You know, and getting on with all of them. You know? uh, and to be rather serious, DCLG after yeah. Grenfell Tower. Yeah. You know? These he did, he took. Yeah? And the impossible he did. He went into the ruck and he came out the other side without a hair out of place. And that is, of course, allowing for his haircut. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the James we knew and we love. And, of course, our nation needs people like James. I mean, yes. my rightful friend, the ex-Prime Minister, was right. We need people like, like James. Because... When the unimportant flash and crackle of politics is gone, the nation depends on those like James who do their jobs brilliantly but quietly. James served this nation uh, with great honour, total integrity and enormous skill. And he will be sorely missed by all. Yeah. Yeah. Chris Grayling. Deputy Speaker, I just want to say two things. Firstly, to James's family, 
You don't get occasions like this in the Commons very often. Uh, there's not many of us who could command this kind of collective tribute from across the House. And that says this was a very special man indeed. And the second thing I wanted to say is that during his last few months, James dealt with his illness with incredible bravery. If you spoke to him, it was just like a normal conversation with James. It was like the world carrying on. And yet, behind all of that, he was carrying the most incredible burden. And he did it with decency uh, and bravery beyond anything I can imagine almost anybody could have done. And that is also an enormous tribute to him. And so we have lost, and I have lost, this house has lost, and this country has lost a great man. But to me, I've lost a great friend. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gareth Bacon. Yeah, um, I could spend a very long time talking about James Brokenshire. I, I knew him for the best part of a decade and a half. And indeed, for the last 11 and a half years, he served as my local member of parliament in Obexton Sigcup. But James, to me, was, was so much more than that. He, uh, he was a dedicated and exceptional public servant, but he was also a very loyal friend. But above all, James was a family man. And my heart goes out to Cathy, to Sophie, to Gemma and to Ben. The courage with which James faced up to his illness and the determination with which he fought it, his refusal to feel self-pity and the steadfast determination to remain positive really was the mark of the man. He was taken from us far too soon. His constituents and his country have lost a great public servant, as my right honourable friend, the member for Bexheath and Crayford, has said. We have lost a much valued colleague. I will miss him terribly, but I will always be grateful for the privilege of having known him and the honour to be able to call him my friend. James, rest in peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Hillier. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I too had more to say than I have time for, but I, others have talked about his ministerial career. And I first met James, we were elected together in 2005. And then when I became a minister in the Home Office, he was my shadow. Um, and always, as others have said, you had to be on your mettle because you knew that he would be on the case. And I often reflected when the Honourable, uh, Right Honourable Lady, the Member for Maidenhead, was Home Secretary, that she was very lucky to have James in that post. And I did notice, Madam Deputy Speaker, that his portfolio seemed to grow uh, in that department. <laughs> that every tricky area of the Home Office, and having been a Home Office Minister, I know all those tricky areas, they came to James because he was in all the best traditions of this place an assiduous and proper minister. And in a period when we have a lot of fracture in our politics and in society, and in an era where, frankly, you know, being a YouTuber or a celebrity sometimes is seen as something very important, James did the job really well and really properly. And often that's underplayed, but that is really important. And I think that all of us, whether we're in government or we aspire to be in government, could use James, should use James, and the work that he did as a model for how to do the job. And I think the, the last thing I would point I would make, Madam Deputy Speaker, is his courage on, when he was, Shadow, when he was Minister, Secretary of State at the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government post Grenfell, of giving a ministerial direction to set up the £200 million fund to provide money to deal with some of the dangerous cladding. Not, a lot of ministers don't want to give ministerial directions. That's when they have to instruct officials they're going to spend taxpayers' money. He didn't do that lightly. He thought it through. And I remember having a conversation with him where he said, you know, in one case, there were about 89 owners of a block, and if he hadn't made this decision, it would get caught up forever, and people, the people living in those homes, would suffer. There's still unfinished business, as the father of the house has said on that. But James set the tone, made a bold decision. He was courageous, he was good, and we will miss him in this house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damien Green. Damien Green. Deputy Speaker. As we've heard, James was a model of what you would want your MP or your minister and, most of all, your friend to be. Uh, I first met James in the Shadow Home Affairs team uh, before the 2010 election uh, and then as, as junior ministers in the Home Office for four years. And he was the perfect colleague. Uh, many was the evening where 
we gave each other mutual support, not just about the pressures of the job, but the added pressures of working for an exceptionally demanding Home Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> he was diligent, thoughtful, collegiate, an absolute team player. To revive an old cliché, he was absolutely a man you would go into the jungle with. He would have your back. But all these tributes to his political effectiveness are not just standard conventional remarks to make on an occasion uh, like this. We can, we can simply look at the facts. James was appointed and reappointed to a succession of really difficult ministerial jobs by all three Prime Ministers since 2010. Almost no one else has negotiated those particular rapids as successfully <laughs> as James has. So, in, in paying tribute to him, of course we mourn with, with Cathy and the children, but we should also celebrate James's political legacy, because above all, he showed that it was possible to be a completely admirable human being and a successful member of Parliament. And in these times, that is a great and important memory to leave all of us. Yeah. David Mondell. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's, it's an honour to contribute to this debate and so much. Uh, has already been said about James, and uh, I regard it as a huge honour to have been a friend and seen him as a friend. High office is actually a very lonely place, as uh, many people around this chamber will know, and the ability to be able to speak to someone openly and not to think that that will appear in the front page of tomorrow's paper or to be uh, part of online speculation uh, about yourself or colleagues uh, is hard to find. And when I was a cabinet member, when I was a minister, shadow minister, James was someone I always felt that I could speak to in total confidence, somebody who would give support, support in a way that was you know, for my benefit, not uh, for any uh, benefit uh, to him, somebody who would be candid, and as we've heard, somebody who would be funny about it as well, because you can be uh, nice and you can be very funny uh, and have a wicked sense of humour uh, too. And I'm just very grateful for the support that he gave me uh, when I uh, was a minister as well. I was also struck by his self-effacing nature. I just looked as we started this discussion at the last exchange of messages that I had with him uh, about um, his situation. And it was his thanks to me for my, you know, for my concern, and it was the fact that all of us had given him so much love and support over the period that he was so grateful for, wanted to convey that, and said had sustained him in some of the most difficult uh, times. The final uh, point I want to make is I was actually with Sir David Amos when we heard the news uh, in Qatar uh, of James is passing. And David was very upset by that uh, news. He, re he really was. And uh, David was very, very effusive in his tributes to James. And I'm sure if he'd been in this chamber today, he would have wanted uh, to make such a contribution. Uh, we heard earlier, you know, social media isn't the, the friendliest place. But there's a great picture that was put up uh, on Twitter, which has Sir David uh, advocating the case for Southend uh, as a city in this Parliament, with James sitting over his shoulder laughing. And that's the picture that I would like to you know, retain in my mind of those two great parliamentarians, great uh, men who have contributed so much to our national life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Greg Clark. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. The House has paid tribute uh, to James's kindness and his courage uh, in facing his illness, but I'd like to underline his effectiveness as a minister and the consequences uh, of that for uh, ordinary people that perhaps are not aware of the impact. I remember when he was Northern Ireland Secretary, uh, the Bombardier Air Aerospace Company uh, was facing a ruinous <coughs> trade dispute uh, with Boeing. It would have been the end uh, of that employer uh, in Northern Ireland. James immediately sprang to life uh, and activated the, the very considerable networks uh, of influence and friends of Northern Ireland uh, in Washington. 
uh, so that against all expectations, uh, that dispute was settled uh, in favour of Bombardier, and many thousands of people uh, owe their continued livelihood uh, to James's uh, brilliant advocacy. Uh, it was very fitting that he uh, became uh, local government secretary because, as the father of the House said, uh, his father Peter uh, had been the chief executive of, uh, of Epping Forest uh, District Council before the London Borough of Greenwich. Um, and he was widely uh, admired, not just by his officials uh, in the department, though, as my right honourable friend has said, that was universal but also by councillors of all parties up and down the country. Uh, in fact, his, uh, his permanent secretary, uh, Melanie Dawes, um, described him as a dedicated, brilliant uh, and kind man, I think speaking for all uh, of local government. I last met James uh, in July. Uh, our daughters were classmates uh, at school, uh, and we last met uh, at the speech day, which was the leaving day uh, for uh, our daughters uh, at that school. Uh, and so my, my last image uh, of James uh, is a happy one, um, celebrating uh, the wonderful success uh, of his daughter, uh, seeing her move on to the next stage of her life, uh, having succeeded uh, in raising a wonderful young woman uh, who'd be greatly missed by them and by this whole house. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy Wright. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker, and thank you too and to Mr Speaker for allowing time for us to make these tributes to yeah. James. Tributes that he would never have expected, and which he deserves all the more for that. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, some of the tributes that I've heard to James have said that he took his work seriously, but he never took himself too seriously. And that is true. But I think it should also be said that he was taken seriously yes. by those he worked with, by those in every area he had responsibility for as a minister and by all those he sought to help. And that matters. Because if you want to get things done in politics and in government, then people have to believe that you care enough to want to help, that you have the capacity to help, and that you'll put enough effort into helping to be effective. And no one who dealt with James was in any doubt on any of those counts. They knew how much he cared, they knew he was capable, and they knew he was committed. In every one of the difficult areas he dealt with as a minister, and in every case brought to him as a constituency member of parliament. Madam Deputy Speaker, I will remember for a long time uh, the weekend that the Wrights went to visit the Broken Shires at Hillsborough Castle when James was Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. And in the course of that visit, I was struck by how James, who'd not been in the job long at that point, was widely recognised and warmly welcomed at all the community events that James being James, he was keen we all went to during that weekend, including, I recall, a gathering of the Lama farmers of Northern Ireland, <laughs> of whom I think there were about four. And uh, James went, as always, to take an interest and not just to take a photograph. And when we contemplate, Madam Deputy Speaker, the two empty spaces on these benches this week, we think about underrated qualities in politics. And James had in abundance those qualities that perhaps the parliamentary sketch writers aren't terribly interested in, but which are fundamental to meaningful public service. He was intelligent, he was brave, he was determined, he was compassionate, he was wise. There was no cabinet meeting I attended with him and no cabinet he was a member of that was not immeasurably strengthened by his presence. Of course his family will miss him most, and Kathy, Sophie, Gemma, Ben, you know you have our love and prayers as you mourn him and as you are unfailingly proud of him, as so many of us are too. But for the many of us who will think of him first and foremost as our friend, we will remember him that way. But for all of us, we should remember the example he set of how to be a public servant and strive to follow it. Yeah. 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 Mike Penny. Much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, 
as an Essex boy, uh, James and I got on like a house on fire when we were both elected in 2005. Interestingly enough, as we became ministers together, we shared departments together, and I've listened very carefully to the fact that James got all the difficult bits, <laughs> and the police minister didn't. Some of that was news to me, Madam Deputy Speaker. But he was, as we used to drive home in the car, we were both shadow ministers. We used to drive home, and we were chewed to cut about many things, as new members of Parliament. James was a wonderful human being. But he was a family man. We talked invariably about family things on the way home. I knew that I'd have to move my daughters out of my school, their school in South End, to my new constituency in Hemel Hempstead. And he talked to me about how difficult that was going to be for me. And I apologised to Cathy. We sat outside your house many a time when I was dropping him off, and he didn't come in quite as soon as he should have done. Because <laughs> we did talk about other things as well, particularly his haircut. For those that didn't know James in his early days in this, he had a wonderful flat top and how carefully it was trimmed. We spent hours talking about this. So <laughs> people may think that men don't talk about that sort of thing, but we did. And we talked about our kids and we talked about you know, life in general as well as this greasy pole. When, when he went to Northern Ireland, he came back to me and said, you've been there, Mike, could I talk, take some advice from you? We've heard so much in this house about people taking advice from James, but he was a sponge. He wanted to listen to other people's experiences, whether in the constituency or as former ministers. He continued up that greasy pole, where some firemen like myself disappeared down that greasy pole. But he was absolutely brilliant at putting his arm around you when you needed that five minutes. I phoned him a couple of weeks ago, before his sad death. And we chatted about the usual answer and bits and bobs. And I apologised for phoning him, because it was obvious so how poorly he was at that time. And he said, no, it's all right, mate. We're six boys together. We can have a chat. That was James. And I'm so proud to have known him for so long. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the last word goes to Stephen Hammond. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's a particular privilege, therefore, to have the last word in these tributes to our friend and colleague. Like the last of my three colleagues, we were members of that very exclusive club, the 305 Club. We were elected on 050505, and it was very clear to all of us in that intake that our friend James Brokenshire was going to rise to high ministerial office. And it doesn't need me to say any more than my right honourable friend from Maidenhead and Staffordshire Mordens, and many others have paid tribute to his effectiveness as a minister. My right honourable friend for Swindon South rightly said that James was so much more than a nice man. He used a whole load of uh, adjectives to describe him. The three I will remember is, and I think like most of the 305, he was collegiate, he was compassionate and he was charming. He congratulated all of us on our way up and put his arm round us and created sympathy on our way down. And I needed that more than most. <laughs> I send my sincere condolences to the family. And ladies and gentlemen, the uh, fellow colleagues, next week on Tuesday evening, the, that exclusive club, a year late, celebrates 15 years in this house. And the most fitting tribute we can pay to our friend and colleague is that there will be an empty chair and a toast raised. Thank you all for these moving tributes to our friend James. Order. Order. Before I call Harriet Harman to ask her urgent question, I wish to remind all members that the House's sub judice res resolution means that no reference should be made to cases in which legal proceedings are active, which includes those where an individual has been charged with an offence. 
I would also ask members to exercise caution in discussing matters which are subject